value at the point a half because that's of arithmetic significance. But the basic idea is always to switch orders and we will, one way or another, face this. And how are we going to study that? How, that, how does that vary? So I want to illustrate this with a family F, N, which is my favorite at this point, which is the holomorphic forms. So let's say N is prime throughout this lecture. And S to N consists of the holomorphic cusp forms of weight two for this modular curve or congruent subgroup gamma naught N. And just to remind you, these are functions f a z plus b over c z plus d equal to c b plus d squared times f of z. It's nothing special about weight two. It's just the sexiest, if you like. <laughs> Certainly, the many people's favorite. It's cusp forms like this. Cusp form is some technical thing about the behavior of the function in, if you make a Fourier expansion in the cusp, there's no constant terms. The series starts from n equals one. So this is what these are. It's a finite dimensional space. And most importantly, I'm assuming, of course, that F is a Hecker eigenform. In other words, as Hecker, this is one of Hecker's discoveries in his sort of rejuvenation of modular forms this century, is that the L function, this is basically his discovery. The L function over there has an Euler product, and I said in the first lecture, only a, it's absolutely essential we have an Euler product before we start to ask for a Riemann hypothesis. It's meaningless otherwise. And the, the Euler product is tied to the fact that this function satisfies a differential equation in the upper half plane, the differential equation being d bar f equal to zero, that's a holomorphic, but there's also other equations, eigenvalues of the Hecke operators. So I'll be a little loose here. Let's say TPF of Z, there's a weight here that I'll ignore. But basically, if you sum over all matrices, a, two by two matrices, A, B, C, D, after you divide by, this is gamma naught N, you divide by gamma one, and I'm taking representatives, B modulo D, so A and D are positive. These are integers of f of a z plus b over d is a weight here which I ignore, then these preserve hol holomorphicity and because this is a complete residue, sorry? TN. Yeah, this is Tn, thank you. Thank you. It turns out that this Tn maps the space into itself and P should not, N should be relatively prime to capital N, otherwise some care must be taken. And it turns out also, and this uh, uh, is important for us, that the TNs are self-adjoint relative to a certain inner product, which remarkably Hecker, it's amazing, one of the, the things that Hecker, Hecker wanted to prove these were self-adjoint, very eager to prove they were self-adjoint. And uh, it didn't occur to him to just use the hyperbolic volume form, y squared, dx dy over y squared, with the weight built in when you have a weight, but relative to that inner product, in other words, the integral over x naught n of f of z, g of z, bar y to the k, where k here would be y to the 1. This is an inner product on s naught n, relative to which it's very easy to prove these are self-adjoint. So the Hecker, so these are self-adjoint, and they commute with one another, and they have certain relations. So Tn, Tm is Tn, M, if N and M are relatively prime, and otherwise there's some simple formula of this type. And we can, because they commute with each other, we can simultaneously diagonalize all the F. So every F I talk about is going to be a Hecker eigenform for all Ns which are relatively prime to capital N. We can arrange that, and the eigenvalues will be real. And it's very easy to then operate on the Fourier expansion and see that the eigenvalues of the TNs, which I've written no in normalized form here at lambda fn, are also the Fourier coefficients in a Q expansion. So these lambda fn's are not just any old thing. They are the eigenvalues of the nth Hecker operator on f. And we can, of course, choose the f's to be an orthonormal basis of this because these TNs commute with each other and are self-adjoint. And we do that. So then, another way of saying what the sum is here, 
So this sum, this key sum that I wrote down, which was the sum of lambda fn, f in f, or f in s2 n in this example, is something which is just the trace. So this can be interpreted as the trace of the Hecke operator Tn on this finite dimensional vector space Sn. So that's certainly one way to try examine the behavior of the average over the family when I have just one coefficient, which I clearly at some point am going to face. And perhaps this could be computed in another way. And it's certainly an approach to this problem, but not the approach we'll take. But I have to point it out, because this Sorry, what? You really mean what you've written there? Well, Hecker eigenforms. No, you mean this is an uncountable? Yeah, I take a basis. So here F will be, well, maybe I'll write Fj. And then it means take an orthonormal basis. Yes, no, I'm taking the trace. All right, so one way to compute this is the famous Eichler Selberg trace formula. And it's a certainly gives exactly another closed form answer for this trace in this case. And for, in fact, any Riemann surface on which you have a, a correspondence, you can compute the trace of the correspondence on the curve. And that, it's a variation on the left shift's trace formula. What happens is you take this Tn. So in this case, we're working on holomorphic forms of weight 2, which just means uh, holomorphic differentials, and it's essentially gotten by counting the fixed points of Tn, which gives you the answer. That's the way Eichler viewed it. Selberg, uh, the famous Selberg trace formula is a much more general statement, not just for holomorphic forms, of which this is one of the most important special cases. So you can, so th this is a theory, and it gives the answer, gives this trace in terms of guess what? something that I mentioned in the very beginning of these lectures, class numbers of binary quadratic forms. Because you can imagine that's going to enter because I will have something like AZ plus B over CZ plus D. I'll be trying to compute in the upper half plane divided by this, well, it's not the full modular group. N is prime, it's got two cusps. Looks something like this. And you will be computing fixed points of something of that nature. And you'll be solving this equals Z. And you'll certainly get quadratic equations, that much I'll tell you. And it's not difficult to compute. This uh, Selberg, who's got some kind of sense of humor, said it took Eichler five letters to get the right formula. In other words, Eichler wrote him, said, I also have this formula. They did it at the same time. And Selberg said, what's your formula? And he wrote, he said, no, you got that wrong. And then on the fifth letter, he finally had the thing exact. But Eichler was a brilliant guy. He was, had absolutely essential ideas, and I think one of the underestimated guys in the subject. It is true that every page that he writes has got mistakes on it, but very small arithmetical calculational errors, things of that nature. If you do it right, you'll get an exact formula. It's written uh, in Selberg's paper, for example. It's written in many other places. This gives the trace in terms of class numbers of quadratic fields or, quad or orders in quadratic fields, so binary quadratic forms, in uh, definite binary quadratic forms, and sums of these. And that can get you some distance, in, but we're looking at something that's very, very subtle. So if we proceed this way, it's in fact quite difficult to uh, see sort of a main term and fluctuatory terms when we start averaging over the family. And uh, it's not that this can't be pushed through to make something. It's just there's a, apparently a better way in this specific case. I have, I have a student, I'll mention his result at the end, who did actually pursue exactly this formula with the class numbers, but then reduce, replacing the class numbers by L functions, L1 chi, and then writing a series there, and then using exponential sums. In the end, we can't avoid exponential sums. And he was able to obtain some results, which I'll describe at the end, by using the trace formula rather than what I'm about to write down. There's another formula which is less known and more useful in this case, and Ivanich and I have used profitably here. That's what I'm describing. 
and Ivanich Luo and I, in the proof of any of these theorems that on average these conjectures that cats and I, I mean these conjectures of cats and I for these families are true in the range that I described in the last lecture, also uses this formula that I'm about to write down. And it's an older formula than the trace formula. It's an older formula. When Peterson wrote down this inner product and pointed out these Hecker operators are self adjoint he also developed this, which is not a trace, but which is, uh, well, look at the formula and you'll see. Peterson's formula, and this is our main tool. I'll describe all the terms in the formula right now, except for some weights. The sum f, excuse me, this sum is a gain over the basis. It's just I don't want to introduce an index j, it's ugly. So f, so this orthonormal basis of Hecker normalized eigenforms. There'll be a way to say a word about this. Lambda Fn, lambda Fm. So it's a sum. And it's given by something very nice. Delta Mn, a Kronecker symbol. It's clear that the, the weights, just let me jump ahead a little bit. The weights will be non actually positive. There'll be real numbers, which will, uh, one of the key things is I would like to at least mention here that in our work now, these weights are harmless. They used to always be things that everything was contaminated with these weights, and we've been able to actually remove them from all discussions. And this is a crucial point, so I will slough over it, but just say that they're there. They are symmetric square L functions at special points, but they, as we understand, harmless. They're non negative. So if n equals m, remember these numbers are real, then I'm summing positive stuff, so I should get something big. The weights are so normalized so that it's r roughly one of a capital N. The dimension here, if, N, if on X naught N, the genus is roughly N. So the main term, maybe I would put a one over N here and then make these weights size one. Just normalize it that way if you wish. Plus, and here's a crucial point, it's not equal to this or else all our problems would be trivial and the fluctuations and the, re and the kind of you know, monodromy limits that I was talking about wouldn't be there. They all come from this. And over here we have the following sum, C congruent to zero modulo N. A Klostermann sum, which I'll define for you in a second. Now this is the kind of formula that people say, what on earth, why is this useful? I want to, it's fantastic, this formula. So this is the formula, I have to define everything in the formula. J is the J vessel function. J is just the vessel function, which is some special function which behaves in infinity in a fast enough way, it decays fast enough so as to make the series converge, and it has a certain behavior at the origin, and I'll assume that this is not frightening to anybody. It's a J-Bessel function, it's just a special function. This, which is less familiar, is a Klostermann sum, it's just the finite field analog of a Bessel function. So just like the Gauss sum is the analog of the gamma function, the Klostermann sum is the analog of a Bessel function. So let me give you its definition. And you can recognize it as such. SMNC is the sum over X modulo C. Invertible modulo C. X, X bar is 1. So I'll assume X bar is the inverse of X modulo 1. And then the additive character E to the 2 pi I. E of Z is E to the 2 pi I Z always. Of MX plus nx bar over c. So this is an additive character evaluated on a hyperplane, which if you look at some, there are all sorts of representations for the Bessel functions. You would recognize, say, if c is a prime, that this is exactly the finite field analog of the Bessel function. So somehow that's naturally in this problem. And this is a finite sum. And these numbers are of modulus 1. So we are adding C numbers of modulus 1. If they're random, like ordinary random numbers, then they may cancel nicely. And that's a very deep inequality due to they. And it's exactly the Riemann hypothesis. For, I made a comment last time that in the function field, the interest of the Riemann hypothesis in the function field is not just analogy. If that were its only interest, it would have not led us that far yet, because it hasn't offered us so much on the Riemann zeta function. But these, in these, uh, the Riemann hypothesis in the function field is a very important theorem on its own right, and uh, it gives us bounds on things like this, which are now our bread and butter. 
In other words, this is, there is a lot of cancellation in the sum, and if it were random, I should get square root C cancellation, and that's Bayes' theorem. So it follows from the Riemann hypothesis applied to specific curves, so-called artin schreier curves, that, and that's what Bayes showed in 48, though this, according to Lang, and if you check it, he's correct, this was certainly in Hassa in 1933, that if you could prove the Riemann hypothesis, you could make this estimate. So I don't really care if it's due to, it's the following is true. This is less than or equal to the number of divisors of C, which is a, mo uh, a function which grows like slower than any power of C. So you should think of that as almost bounded times square root C times the greatest common divisor of M, N, and C to the half. That's, so the key is the square root C there. So if C is a prime, you get square root cancellation in that sum. And that is why you should think of that term as a fluctuatory part or oscillatory part beyond the main term. However, what I was trying to convey yesterday was for the first time, more or less the first time that I've seen this, in what I was describing beyond the diagonal, I made some vague comments that we can prove this conjecture beyond the diagonal. What was really going on there is when the support of that function is bigger than one, new terms have to come. And for the first time in the main term, contributing to the main term, one gets stuff from close to sums. Usually the game with close to sums is you put this bound and you win. But this was the first time I've seen close to sums come and contribute to the main term and was delightful because uh, Katz and my conjecture would have been wrong if, if it didn't contribute, it contributed exactly what it was supposed to. So it was an unusual experience. So that is not something to forget about, this oscillatory stuff. Now I haven't told you what WF is, but allow me to just tell you that in today's technology we can ignore it. Uh, for a long time we thought that was there and it would contaminate all things. But, uh, and that's why one might always run to the trace formula, which really computes a trace with weight one, but in fact, uh, by techniques that are similar to what I'll describe a little bit later, one can remove that. So there is the key averaging procedure. This is a procedure to average over the family. You absorb them in the lambda F or you we absorb them into the big mollifiers, which you'll see in a minute. But in any problem I know now, I know how to. But in this formula, are they related to periods of F? They're related to the symmetric, say, say F, if N is prime, everything is non-CM, then it's the symmetric square L function at one, at the point of convergence, which is arithmetically much simpler than at the point a half, which is where we're trying to understand this. So they, that WF is an arithmetic thing. But what I'm saying is I can roughly multiply by one over WF, t take it in and take it out as I see fit. Uh, the yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, very good. Let me answer that question. That's a crucial. That's a quadratic formula. This is a linear formula. In fact, in, pra uh, in point of fact, they really this, they, there's the same information, though that's packaged. In principle, I can't see why one goes further with that than with that, except that that is packaged with Klosterman sums, and somehow we just know so much more about Klosterman sums than class numbers. But at a, at a very basic level, this seems to be very different. This is linear, that's quadratic. No, that's not a problem because, because of the relations. So I'm saying they have the same amount of information because there are certain relations between Tn and Tm, which lead to the following, that lambda Fn, lambda Fm, is the sum of all d dividing the greatest common divisor of m and n of lambda f of n m over d squared. So you can always convert a quadratic to a linear, small sum of linear terms. You, that's a very good point you ask, and, but they're really the same because of the, these relations. And these relations are inherited directly from relations which uh, are at the level of the operators. So the eigenvalues inherit them. Okay, so you, in principle, you should be able to go just as far with the trace formulas with that, but in practice, that's not the case. All right, so that's the key averaging mechanism. And now, let me describe how you might average, or what you might average. So for the theorems which were conditional, which assume the Riemann hypothesis in order to get the biggest range, in order to establish these conjectures about the low-lying distribution following, in this case, for this family, it was an infinite orthogonal group. 
you want to start having sums over the zeros. And I want to remind you, this goes by, what I'm about to write down here goes in the literature by the name, the very explicit formula, but this is surely in Riemann. It's just in Riemann, in, it's really there. And this is the connection between, so the, with this formula, I can always transform a problem about zeros to a problem about primes and Fourier coefficients, albeit an extremely difficult problem, and maybe begging the question, there is a way of going from the one to the other. So if you have these conjectures, you could try to do the following. If I look at the logarithmic derivative of any one of our L functions, so this you will find in Riemann for the Riemann zeta function, this will be a series which looks like some coefficients, and I'll tell you the relation to that in a second. A, F, N, lambda, N over N to the S. This, now this uses the Euler product. You take the Euler product and take log and differentiate. Well, a product was made to <laughs> take logarithmic derivative. These coefficients then, a simple computation in this case for the family I'm talking about, will be alpha fp to the m plus beta f. I write it in this awkward way just because it allows one to look at more general things. The mth power of these roots where alphas and betas are defined this way. Alpha f, lambda f of p is alpha f, alpha fp plus beta fp. So the lambda is the sum of the roots and the product alpha fp times beta fp in this case of gamma naught n is one. These are inverses. So if I know lambda, this declares alpha and beta and this is the symmetric power of the roots. So that's what this afp to the m is. And it, this lives only on prime powers because lambda n and uh, it may well be Landau who invented this notation of this lambda n. This is log p if n is a prime power and it's zero otherwise. Anybody who's worked with primes eventually realizes the primes were supposed to be weighted with log p. They're not supposed to be counted with weight one. So we invent an, a, an actual function called lambda. I think people call it von Mangold's function. Certainly Landau, it's all over the show. He, he's, uh, loves this particular thing. Anyway, this restricts to prime powers. So we have the logarithmic derivative is this. Now you do something that Riemann did, which is you shift the contour, you write an integral, shift contour, and use the functional equation. You'll get the following identity, which I want to write down. Because it is something that can be used to prove theorems. As I said, this goes by the name of the explicit formula, which is usually only written down for Hecker L functions, but this is identical. So if phi is a test function, in fact, I should really have that uh, phi hat. I would really want phi hat to be of compact support, of compact support, so that phi is entire with some growth properties, because I don't want to assume any zeros on the line of half. I could assume it's in Schwartz class, but you'll see this gets evaluated at the zeros. So if I write the zeros as a half plus i gamma f, I'm just doing a contour shift. This is elementary complex variables. So this is the logarithmic derivative of that function. And you take an arbitrary test function phi with, say, phi entire. You can write the following identity. The sum over the gamma f's. There's no assumption here that the Riemann hypothesis is true. You just introduce the gammas as the zeros are just, excuse me, the zeros are written as a half plus i gamma. And if the Riemann hypothesis for the cell function is true, those are indeed real numbers. Otherwise, they're complex numbers. But I really want phi to be entire, so this makes sense. And you get the following identity. The sum over the zeros of this test function, which is how we measure their distribution near a half, is log of the conductor over 2 pi. This is why that scale that I was keeping mysterious in the last lecture, phi of x dx, so this is convergent, plus big O1. So this is blowing up like log n, so I'm going to neg neglect all terms that are smaller than something growing like log n. And then a term here, which is the hard term to deal with, the sum over the coefficients. So this is a relation between the zeros, or the imaginary part of the zeros, and the coefficients. And the Fourier transform here, evaluated at log m over 2 pi. So at the logs of the primes, this restricts to prime powers. That's just, uh, you have something exact here, by the way. I just am interested in asymptotics as n goes to infinity. 
So phi is a fixed test function. The sum over the zeros, which we may build the scale so that it measures the zeros near a half, is this continuous term, which is one part of the term, and then some stuff that's very hard to analyze, because what do I know about the coefficients and the primes, and it seems I'm in a vicious circle. But if I start to average over the family, which is what the conjecture was about, it's not a statement about one, the lowest zero of one guy. That, that, that could be whatever it wants to be. If I start to average over f in gamma naught n, then I'll get the kind of sum that I wrote down. I'll get something easy here, and then I will have the privilege of writing AF in terms of lambda f, and then using the Peterson formula and re-expressing this in terms of things which I beg you to believe me, we can analyze to some extent, to the extent that I got that one gets the theorem I described. So this explicit formula allows you unconditionally to go a certain distance. If you want to use it to say uh, the kind of un result about Birch, Winnett, and Dyer, about vanishing at a half, then I have to use inequalities. I just point out this is the only place where we need to use a Riemann hypothesis, and it's sort of a harmless way, but it, I don't know how to get rid of it. Meaning, if these zeros are on the line a half, so that the gammas are really real, and I put a test function phi, I can say that this sum is the sum near a half that I'm getting, and whatever else is positive. But if these are really complex numbers, I don't have any inequalities. So the only way we use the Riemann hypothesis in that context is in this m very mild way. But it's uh, not a way that I know how to get rid of here. And that led to the kind of theorems I described of how many uh, L functions in gamma naught n vanish at the point R for the distribution of the low-lying zeros following the conjectures we want. And I already have mentioned that the remarkable thing is that the Klostermann sums contribute to the answer in a way that was very much demanded by the conjecture and made us feel very pleased that we really are probably, this conjecture has a very good chance of being true because there was this new term appearing but let's be absolutely clear here. We're not seeing any symmetry group here. We have a group, we have a function field that makes a prediction. We use that to predict something, and then we try to prove it. And at this point, we're proving it by the tools we have. We just say, this has to be true. Let's try to verify it. And we are able to do it to some degree. All right. I want to spend the, the rest of these lectures, so the next half hour, showing you how one gets, attacks this problem of, say, vanishing at a half in a different fashion, which allows us to make everything unconditional. It runs much deeper. And so this is this paper with Ivanich that I will now briefly outline. So the key thing here is not to take the logarithmic derivative. By taking the logarithmic derivative, I've introduced a sum over primes. And in this world, it's very hard to sum out of primes subtle things without appealing to the Riemann hypothesis, if it's a very subtle issue. Sieves, which are unconditional beasts, can't even prove they're infinitely many primes by themselves. That's why twin primes, we don't have the infinitely many twin primes. The minute you really had the sieve producing infinitely many primes, you would have infinitely many twin primes. The sieve, together with analytic machinery, allows you to prove theorems that I was circulating here, that the infinitely many primes of the form x fourth plus y squared, this, this paper of Friedland. Sub theory, if it was, uh, tries, tries to count primes by counting integers and sieving, but there are certain sieving limits which have kept the subject, yeah, the success is to limit the number of primes. To produce primes, sieves have been not successful. And this is a sum over primes because of the lambda. So it is going to be from the start, if you want to do something unconditional, you would rather see sum over integers. Sums over integers are friendlier. They Poisson sum is a thing you might apply to. And of course is applied, one does apply it. So let's try to attack this problem differently. Let's try, look at L. Now you might argue, you see, the zeros seem to, we like to believe the zeros have a distribution, they have meaning. Being analysts, <laughs> the L at a half means nothing to me, it's some number. Of course, it means a lot to other people. Once it's not zero, it has a meaning conjecturally. The birch and I conjecture for this thing has a refinement. But let's just write down L over half and see, can we try to show that a lot of these numbers are not zero? Now, remember, they're going to be the guys with even functional equation. I, in the first lecture, I already described that and with odd functional equation. But let me just write this down, lambda fn over square root n. 
Uh, I'll give you another remark, philosophical remark about the methods. That, by the way, can be shown to converge conditionally. So this is a genuine representation of that value. We now, in the region of convergence, we're in the middle of the critical strip. It's by far the most interesting point. The series actually does converge conditionally to this number. But in this kind of analysis, conditionally convergent series are worthless. Is this uh, form of weight two? Any, I'll stick to forms of weight two. I've normalized, absolutely normalized the lambda fn, Ramanujan is lambda fn is bigger n to the epsilon. So lambda prime is less than two. Correct. And the functional equation is S into one minus S, and that I know it's painful, but please swallow. We evaluate it at half. <laughs> okay, so this actually converges, but I want to emphasize that the, such a statement, I, I will use it anyway this way just to illustrate ideas. There's no, to us, there's no series, there, there are only finite series. When I want to switch orders, what I really want to d know is how fast this converges to answers. I really would always want to write down a finite sum plus something that's small that will be averaged over. There is no infinite series. I'm not interested in infinite series. So the fact that that might represent that function as a conditionally convergent series, which is easy to prove, is not useful. But it is good for me to illustrate a point. That's what the value is. And one might try to do the following. One might try to take L a half F and sum this f of uh, S2n, cusp forms, and maybe this sum is big, then I would know a lot of these are not zero. Well, n's prime. Oh, no, f sub j. Uh, okay, uh, that notation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not summing of an uncountable set. Okay, we're going to do this in a minute. And we are going to do this, so let me just uh, bring back, I want to also bring the Ziegel zero back into the game. So let chi q be Ziegel zero, or the Ziegel Landau zero, which we've named, <laughs> is uh, a possible horrible zero of an L function Ls chi, where chi is quadratic, q is its conductor. Q is primitive, think of q as prime, so there's only one non-trivial quadratic character. And we would be interested in L1 chi q. It seems to have nothing to do with that. In fact, that's why any statement there implying there is interesting. OK. One thing I can do, which is standard in the theory, you can form a function, which is a simple relative of this. I get the name twist. Everybody does the twist here. Chi q n over n to the s. The point is that this new beast is again a modular form coefficient, and this is again a nice L function. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Tensor chi. So you twist by chi. This is a new guy, satisfies all the same properties before in the sense that it's got an analytic continuation function equation and can be evaluated at a half. That makes sense. Now I want to state a theorem which I have said in some other lectures, we'll say again here, which in some sense I view is the deepest fact we know in all of analytic number theory that we can prove. And it's its use that Ivanich and I have been trying to make use of this in a serious way. We do not know, so let me tell you what we do not know, and it's very closely related to the Ziegel zero, that if I take LF chi q, L a half chi q, this should be non-negative. Why? If I look at Ls chi q, this is the L function. It's real on the real axis. It's certainly positive if S is bigger than 100, because the main term dominates. It's real. If there are no zeros, then there'll be no zeros all the way up to the half line. It cannot have got negative by the point a half. So if this were negative, the Riemann hypothesis would be false in the most spectacular way. A Ziegel zero is that spectacular way. That's a zero just to the left of one. So we certainly expect this to be true. And if you write it as a series, summation chi q n over square root n as a conditionally convergent series, it's hard to imagine how you're going to prove this directly, that this is non-negative. But that is, should be true. Well, there's a remarkable thing. The analog statement here can be proved. It's a remarkable fact. So fact, and I want to use positivity is the best substitute for lack of knowledge. <laughs> it's the only tool, and I'll remind you why it's the only tool in a second. 
So here's a fact that L one half F twisted by any quadratic character and F any modular form on M, any gamma naught n as long as what it's what's got a trivial central character, this is non-negative. This is a theorem. So if instead I have chi qn, I have this with all any of these coefficients, which themselves are plus minus at random, it's true. It's remarkable we know that, but we don't know that. So this is a sequence of theorems. The one version in terms of ratios, and this is certainly the breakthrough paper, is waltz -Berger. He actually shows this is a, a square by some remarkable thing. There's a paper of Conan and Zagir for some cases. There's a paper of Svetlana Katok and myself, which does much more general cases appeared in the Israel Journal, I'm proud to say. And then there's the best proof due to a student of Jacquet, which uses the relative trace formula and proves this for any automorphic form on GL2, on PGL2, trivial central character, of any number field. The central value is non-negative. Now why am I screaming non-negative as being, well firstly, just at a, at a, as a fact, this seems to be a very deep consequence of the Riemann hypothesis that you can establish. Uh, and up until very recently, I've never been able to use it. I want to use it. Now, I should remind you that everything we know about the Riemann zeta function, everything, meaning the prime number theorem. How did Adamard prove the prime number theorem? Oh, my French is very bad. Adamard. Or de la vallée, de la vallée pour ça. They tell me I get that wrong every time. Pour ça. <laughs> How did these guys prove the prime number theorem? Or how did Siegel and Landau prove their theorem? Positivity. They form, so Adama, if you go back to his proof, he forms z of s times z of s plus i t times z of s minus i t. Then he uses a little trigonometric uh, inequality saying that because the coefficients are positive and if you have a zero, you would violate positivity. So I'm, I'm assuming you've seen that, but the only tool we have in the subject which allows you to prove non-vanishing, for example, is positivity. And that positivity, which extends to the Ziegel-Landau case, and the way they prove that ineffective result is to form an L function, which is a product of a few L functions, the bad guys with the good guys, and make positive coefficients and then show that you can't have two bad guys. That's why it's ineffective. Their theorem is really you cannot have two Ziegel zeros. So there's either one Ziegel zero, but then there will never be another one. And that's why it's ineffective, because we never see one. The whole game here is to try to use this positivity, it's a completely different positivity, to try to get there's no Ziegel zero. That is, so this, I believe, is a very deep thing, and we have been trying to use that, and that's what I want to describe. How to use that is going to come from the following. So now I can state a theorem which is proved using, uh, it's quite elaborate, but I think I've given you a few hints as to why something like this may be provable. We use this Peterson formula together with a lot of uh, machinery developed in terms of Klosterman sums to average L and to average L squared and to average L times L twisted by chi, those three expressions. And then I'm going to compare these. And so first moment, second moment, and you'll see in a second, we can't do higher moments, but then I will introduce a powerful tool which circumvents all moments. Okay, so here's the key theorem as far as averages. So this is all in this paper that's being written. Let's let N be large. You can make it prime for simplicity. Let's let Q be the twist here at most N to the 1 over 100. Small, small exponent compared to N. Everything will be uniform. So the following are uniformly true in N and Q. This is crucial that the asymptotics are uniform. 1. The sum of F, I, I will stick to my notation of not putting J. <laughs> Let me put the J for God's sake. S to N. Uh, there are many families for which we can deal and have this feature. I'm just describing it in this case. This is asymptotic to N uniformly. So the value at a half twisted, these values are non negative. The N of them, they average up. So if I divide by N, on average, their size is 1. But they may be big or small, we don't know. So to see the further, we square the sum of Fj in S to N of L squared a half F chi Q 
is asymptotic to n log n log qn. So on average, this is not size 1. This is going to be very important. It's a size log. So the L functions at a half, we don't know exactly what's going on. We want to know how many are not 0 and so on. They're non-negative. But whatever they are, on average, they are n. And the squares are about log n. And the third one, which is going to be the way we're going to connect to attack the z equals 0, is the following. I'll write it here, 3. The sum f in S to n, f in S to n, well, I can write it this plus. I could Im immediately, OK, excuse me. Let's assume chi q minus n is 1. This is crucial. L a half f times L a half f twisted by chi q. So I'm now mixing the one with the trivial character with the supposed bad ziggle zero, but this is, these have nothing to do yet with the ziggle zero. This is uniformly asymptotic to n, and here comes my favorite number, L1 chi. Now the way this comes out, if you just imagine a little bit, is you switch orders and uh, you get a main term. The Klusterman sums are not contributing in the main term. Well, after rearrangement gives things coming from squares, and you get summation chi n over n, which uh, is L1 chi eventually. And this is all uniform in n. So if I divide by n, I should perhaps make the average. Then the, on average, L, doesn't matter what Q is, all the way up to that size, on, L is of size 1. L squared is of size logarithm. And the mixed guy is of size L1 chi. Now we're going to do a crazy thing. We want to prove L1 chi is not small. And I'm adding positive numbers. I'm going to use positivity very heavily in a second. So it would suffice for me to show that most of these are not small, and most of these, and if they are small, the sets on which they're small are different. You really have to break the cycle. You can't, you really have to look at each separately. Now, I have a very good shot of showing that a lot of these are not small and a lot of these are not small separately, because at least the average were one. And I have something on the second moment, which is a variance. I'm asking a much harder question here because I want the two sets to hit. <laughs> and there's no cancellation here. Everything's non-negative. All right, so you'll quickly see, if you think about it, that 50% is a crucial number. So we knew in starting this that the test that we were taking, the pass mark was 50%. And so far, we're still failing. We're looking for extra credit. <laughs> 51 will win, but 50 won't. And you can see this already at this stage, as far as the Ziegel zero goes. There are a number of issues here, firstly. If, if God were nice to us, this might be here average, say, 4, rather than average 1. I'm, I'm dividing by n. Then, by Cauchy-Schwartz, if I have the average of numbers is 1, and the average of the squares is 5, then, almost, then a positive proportion are not 0, just by Cauchy-Schwartz. But this is so made so that this is big. So we have to somehow get rid of the fact that there are a lot of L's that are big. To that, we bring it to the rescue a technique started by Landau. I'll explain to you. The technique of cutting out the large values of L. One way, you might think, take higher powers. It's worse. The higher the power here, we can't actually compute. You can't switch orders and compute the main term if you take any higher power than 4. But anyway, when you start taking higher powers, you get logs to higher powers. Anyway. So. Let's pretend, however, that I had a tool, and I'll show you the tool in a second, to not have to worry about the fact that this average here was log. Suppose this were. Then, uh, then I start to win. If I can show that the set of f's for which L o half, not only is it not zero, but it's big. This was a, in the first lecture, I, I immediately said that when I translate this to pure algebra, Shah came in for experts. Uh, that, that's the weakness here. Uh, it's not enough for me to know that L a half is not zero. I also need to know that it's quite big. Because if I can show the set of places, set of f's in this, of the n of them, where L of a half is big, and the set of f's where this is big are at least sets which intersect non-trivially, then I will have a lower bound of log, and there are no equal zeros. And what we can do, and I'm going to explain now, is we can show that the set of f's for which this guy is big is at least half of all of them. And the set of f's where this guy is big is at least half of all of them, independent of q. 
So this fictitious, terrible conductor, which is causing all the trouble, cannot make, I still have half of these guys are not zero. So as long as I can improve this guy to above 50%, and this guy doesn't know about twisting by Q, I would then actually eliminate the ziggle zero. But you immediately see that 50% is the crucial number to make two sets meet non-trivially. And remarkably, we get to 50%. Now let me tell you the tool that we get to 50%, you, you, it's truly a beautiful thing that even one gets to the, <laughs> to the border. And then this wall was erected at, at 50%, at least in our present state. Why? So let me try to explain this idea of mollification a little bit. So I have a few minutes still. So we're going to try. So how, how do we cheat and get more moments, if you wish, or cut out the values without taking higher powers? Well, the idea is to introduce some unknown series with unknown coefficients, which are then chose to optimize something. As I said, so this is mollification, and it's a crucial tool here that we use. And it's, I mean, it's never been used in this context, but, but it was some, something that looks like this was started with Landau and perfected, I would say, by Selberg. So I'm going to multiply the series here by a series which looks similar with unknown coefficients. I'll put a few of the coefficients in so that the key unknowns I'll call x's. So let me take a short series. M here will be a secondary parameter. I have n, I have q. q is at most n to the 100. Now I'll choose m. I will try to choose it as big as possible so as to carry out the following procedure. I will, I will take a series which has got unknown numbers xm times lambda f of m times the character, this is to fix up to multiply by, by L f a half twisted by chi q, chi q of m times m to the minus a half. That minus a half has to do with the fact that we're working at the point a half there with unknown xms. So xms are unknown. But I will want some bound on them. I want xm to be less than or equal to log m. At most, it grows like logarithm. And then what I'm going to do is try put in these guys as weights. So I will try to form the same sum with, with m and the same sum with m squared. Now, the idea is that I want to put the m's here so as to knock out all the large values of L which are making the mean square large. So that boils down to a quadratic form in more and more variables that I want to extremize. Now, of course, we have extremized this to the end because if we hadn't, we would get over 50%. So it is a remarkable thing that you can do the following. So we normalize. We normalize the XMs. So I said these were unknowns. These are unknown numbers that we're going to choose. They will be eventually given uh, extremal, asymptotic extremal is given in terms of number theoretic quantities, like Mobius functions. Excuse me. So we normalize the XM so that the sum over F in S2N of MF twisted by chi Q times LF twisted by chi Q is N, is asymptotic to N. In other words, these guys are supposed to make the mean no smaller than it was before. So it's a linear constraint on the Xs. And I want to make this as small as possible. And the quadratic part, I want, and we want to minimize. So we will normalize XM so that this is a linear constraint. And then we minimize over the Xs the sum of the squares. And we can solve this problem. So this win for M up to n to the half, we can actually determine the optimal coefficients asymptotically, and we get the following bound. And by doing so, we immediately eliminate all the large values of L, and this way we can guarantee that many of the Ls are not zero, and in fact large. That's just then Cauchy-Schwartz. So the precise statement that I want to state here is theorem. So this is theorem after mollification. So there's a choice of XMs that I could write down for you explicitly, a number theoretic choices which make this as small as possible subject to this linear constraint. That's a quadratic form, so it's not too surprising, or well, there's some hope you might be able to actually solve that problem. So there exists XM, 
which as long as m is less than n to the half over q, we'll choose the m as big as possible, as you'll see for the for certain reason, the sum over f of L squared, this mean square guy, is asymptotic to 2 times n, 1 plus log q. q is small, arbitrary small power of capital N. Everything must be effective here. That's what I was saying. Everything should be finite sums as, as I'm writing it down. So the sum of all the f's of the squares of these numbers, I've normalized the linear term to be uh, on average 1. The squares on average are 2 times this factor. I will then, of course, choose m to be as big as possible so as to knock this down to as small as possible. If you choose m to be n to the half, you'll get another factor of 1 here. The q is arbitrarily small. So this factor is 4. So the ratio of the mean square now to the mean has been reduced all the way down to 4. Now, in these kind of things, you are never at the, <laughs> at the limit. But here, for some reason, this, these numbers take on tremendous significance. So the ratio of the mean square to the, the variance is 4. The, the, the sum is 1. So this means by Cauchy-Schwartz that at least one quarter of all those values are not 0. And this is for f or for f twisted by chi. But if I come back there, I notice that um, for the Ziegel zero problem, I'm summing not over f in S2. I'm only summing of those with even functional equation because the other guys are automatically zero. So one quarter of all is one half of the ones with even functional equations. So we really have shown by this, that was the theorem I announced in the first lecture, that 50% unconditionally of these L half f's are non-zero. And this is the mechanism whereby this positivity, and you use the positivity very heavily, if they, you could show more than 50% are not only small but are large. Just for the L half f, we've already dealt with the twisted guy. So if you say something interesting about the ranks, then you would get the nose equal zeros. But right now, the only unconditional thing proved is that there are many of these that are not zero, and that leads to these theorems that are described about the Morel quotient being large. This is the tool. Mollification is, is, a, is a crucial ingredient. So I'm just saying that if I have a sum of numbers, alpha n, the non-negative is 1, and the sum of alpha n squared is 4, then by Cauchy-Schwartz, at least one quarter of them are not 0. And, uh, where is the factor 4? Now, these look crude things. <laughs> just tighten any screw, right? <laughs> the factor 4? The factor 4 comes from, uh, where was, uh, uh, here. There's a 2 that comes from the optimization of a quadratic form. And there's this factor here, and I will choose, uh, th this, uh, I want to choose m as large as possible so as to make this as small as possible. This, uh, we can only prove in this range. We cannot prove it bigger. So uh, q is an arbitrary small power of capital N, so ignore q. So you can choose n up to, m up to n to the half, that'll cancel that. Yeah. So that's 1 plus 1, 2 times. And then, then the algebra of the signs of the functional equation get me back to 50%, not 25%. Where does the fact that fj is S2n... Uh, we prove this in general. <laughs> I've become a salesman. I only tell it you in the sexiest case. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so now let me just uh, tell you the unconditional theorems that follow from this. And this technique has been used by a student of mine and a student of, two, uh, well, two students of Ivania to prove some other interesting things. And then I will end off with trying to summarize what I've said in these lectures in two minutes. So that's the tool here. It's rather involved, and uh, this feature, uh, we believe, this 50%, this black and white here, seems to be something that happens for very many families. This is an example. We, we have other families. It seems to be a feature of some families. But let me show you what it's not, a case where this 50% is not significant. So corollary. So these are now unconditional theorems. This was all unconditional. So corollary. The Morel quotient, so this is how this dimension m naught n, the biggest quotient with finitely many rational points defined. So this was a quotient of j naught n over q, it's a n's prime. For n large, or the lim inf as n tends to infinity, all this is effective, is greater than or equal, uh, this divided by the dimension of s2 plus n, the even functional equation. So remember that 
The numerical data suggest that this goes to one. We can prove this is at least a half. So this quotient, which has got finitely many rational points, is extremely big. That's our main corollary. And as I was saying, if we can improve that, we really are attacking the z equals zero. A half is a very significant number. So by these methods and in a number of other important tools, we have a theorem of van der Kam. And separately, uh, Michel and Kowalski. So these are Ivanic students. This is my student. I suppose so somehow things should be, they shouldn't be coming up with the same theorem at the same time, but never mind. Some misunderstanding. Yeah. The rank. So this is entirely unconditional. The rank of J naught N over Q. So this is an abelian variety whose dimension is roughly N if N is prime. And the rank, so over the rationals, the rank of the model Vey group. So what can one say about this? What we were looking at is all the even part where we're supposed to pick up little rank. If you look at the odd part, the odd functional equations, each one of those L functions vanish. And so conjecturally, you should get rank out of that. Unfortunately, we don't know things like that. However, there is a very important paper of Gross and Zagier, the same paper that was used in the result that I said, Goldfeld, Gross, Zagier, who gave a slight improvement of the Richler's theorem. In that same paper, they do develop enough towards your Birchwin and Dyer conjecture that if you are odd, and, you've, and then you will, at the point of half, you'll vanish, you can ask about the derivative at a half. If the derivative is not zero and you are odd, then they actually show that uh, you will get some rank there. So it's enough in their paper to count how many odd guys have derivative zero. That's set up for this. Instead of looking at how often L vanishes, let's look at how often L prime vanishes when I'm odd. And what they prove is that that happens at least 70% of the time. So the rank of this is greater or equal to, so we half of the whole dimension, uh, so 7 over 20. This is a remarkable result. And this, of course, uses known gross gear should be added in the dimension of J naught of N. I think it's quite remarkable. The ratio should tend to a half. That's the conjecture here. Now, that's unconditional. All right, so those are the kind of arithmetic results that come by showing many are not zero. Of course, Ivanich and I were mainly interested in this to go beyond 50%, and I wish I had been able to come and say that we had 51%, but we're not. And we've been stuck there for a while, so we believe a fundamentally new ingredient beyond what we have is needed. Let me say one word in one minute about I've given you in these lectures a symmetry group, and I want to just maybe sell it for one more minute. The symmetry group was something we understood in the function field. In the function field, it really told you it was there, it was acting on cohomology, it clearly was the, the scaling limit of monodromy. In the number field, you can take two views right now. I said I have about eight or nine families for which you take the function field and you make predictions and then you check numerically, they correct, and you check by averaging in these kind of techniques and you find that the terms you get agree exactly with the conjectures. So, so you begin to feel that this is probably a true statement. But of course, this could just be a very clever mnemonic. Or whatever the word is, or clever. Th this could just be a way of guessing the answer. It may, there may not be any symmetry group acting on cohomology. That would be a rather sad world, but it's not impossible. This could just be a very w clever way of predicting answers, like, you know, here's a heuristic and it predicts the answer. It is our belief, however, and so let me now turn to, in this minute, to, uh, how, how do I put it? Uh, Paul Cohen, who was my teacher, once was sitting next to me in a lecture, and he started bumping me at some point, saying, you know what a good lecture requires? The first 15 minutes, everybody should understand. The next 15 minutes, a lecturer should un uh, the, the expert should understand. The next 15 minutes, a lecturer should understand. The final 15 minutes, nobody anywhere should understand. So I enter that final part here. Let me make a wild statement. But I really think it's the cause of this behavior. And I think it's a grand Shabotarev theorem. In the, number f in the function field, it was this delin shabotarev theorem that caused the distribution of zeros to behave like the, re uh, the way Katz and I prove it. So it is everybody's dream that if you have, say, an L function like LS chi, let's just look at my favorite family with chi squared equals 1, that 
the way you're going to understand this problem is to give a spectral interpretation of the zeros. I mean, everybody likes to philosophize about this. The evidence that this is the case is perhaps what I've been saying is, I think, some evidence towards it, that, these no that the zeros are very spectral in nature. There seems to be no doubt. Now, suppose that you do have the insight of how to associate, say, some operator. For each chi here, you'll have an operator u chi on a Hilbert space h, such that it's with these, there's some way in which I'll put these on line a half, just allow me that the eigenvalues of this are the zeros there. So there's a spectral interpretation of the zeros. In view of the function field and so on, you might hope that for each chi, because this I'm saying is a family, this u chi is an operator on the same Hilbert space, or at least is a conjugacy class, because it's only its spectrum is important, on the same Hilbert space. If that were the case, then what I I'm telling you must happen is for this family, the reason we have an infinite symplectic structure is that the unitarity is what's going to put all the zeros on the line a half. There will be an extra symmetry for this family. Now, there's no doubt about it. And that extra symmetry will be that there's an alternating form that's preserved. That's what happens in the function field. That's why the zeros are not only unitary, but they're symplectic. They're not only on the line, they have an extra symmetry in this family. They are symplectic. And Alain Kahn has got some, uh, he really does have a spectral, in, uh, an action, a group action with some spectral interpretation, has assured me that indeed in his picture you do get a symplectic symmetry. He's found this alternating form that we predict. I haven't seen it in detail. But that's what the prediction would be. And then why the equidistribution? Well, there's some grand Shabotarev theorem. Not that the eigenvalues, but actually these operators, as you vary over these chi's, increasing the conductor, these operators should become equidistributed in an infinite dimensional symplectic group. And that would immediately have that as a consequence. So it is my dream that there's a grand equidistribution theorem which is responsible for this feature. Okay, that is all pie in the sky. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for bearing with me for so long. <laughs> In other words, in the third one, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. If I take that and I have Q and Q primed, I'll get L1 of the product, chi Q, chi Q prime. Oh. So it's quite functorial, right? Oh, yeah. no, so yeah. the correct generalization of replacing it's one, yeah. Said, yeah, yeah, right. right. Well, it needn't work that way. It does. I'm telling you that. Thank you. Next time I'll give the cube. Now I have a very brief.